Welcome to BC The Beatles, the podcast about the Beatles, everything about the Beatles 24-8. I'm Allison. And I'm Erica. And before we start, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts or stream us on Spotify. And if you're enjoying BC The Beatles, feel free to leave us a preferably five-star review so other Beatle maniacs can find us. Also, don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, slash X, whatever that is. And now TikTok, too. Woohoo! We'll be posting videos, photos, and more from this episode and beyond. And don't forget, you can always email us at bcthebeatles at gmail.com. And Erica, I'm so freaking excited. I know, oh my God. We are in your feeds a few days early today to bring you a very special guest. It is... Beatles producer Giles Martin. Woohoo! Oh my God, so exciting! And he is officially a repeat offender here because he mm-hmm. was with us two years ago during the Get Back slash Let It Be releases, and now he's coming back. He came back to talk to us about Now and Then and the re-release of the Red and Blue albums, which are out today, Friday, November tenth. Woohoo! So exciting! Oh, they're so good. Yeah, and Giles is a man who needs no introduction in this community, but just in case, he is, of course, the son of Beatles producing legend George Martin and the mastermind behind the remixes of Sgt. Pepper, The White Album, Abbey Road, Let It Be slash Get Back, and Last Year's Revolver. Most recently, he co-produced the last Beatles song, Now and Then, with Paul McCartney and remixed the Red and Blue compilation albums released today. Yeah, he began working on Beatles projects alongside his father, of course, starting with the Beatles anthology and later collaborating on the groundbreaking 2006 Love album, one of my favorites. And that, of course, is the mashup soundtrack for the Beatles themed Cirque du Soleil production still running in Las Vegas. And my cat just sneezed into the microphone. So enjoy that. Oh, happy. Oh, happy. Outside of the Beatles, Giles is the executive music director for the band In Excess. He music directed the 2019 Elton John biopic Rocket Man and created last summer's immersive Dolby Atmos mix of the Beach Boys album Pet Sounds. And he's currently the head of audio and sound at Abbey Road Studios and the senior vice president in charge of sound experience for the home audio company Sonos. And Giles is a two-time Grammy winner for his work on The Beatles' Love. And he recently, last year, won an Emmy for his work on Get Back. So he's halfway to an EGOT. Let's get in there. Mm. Welcome, Giles, to Because the Beatles. First off, thank you so much for coming back on the pod. Thank you for having me back. I was behaving myself last time. Most definitely. Yes, you're a great guest, obviously. So yeah, let's get it going. Let's start with Now and Then. Now and Then is just such a masterpiece. And one thing we thought that was just made it over the top beautiful was adding these harmonies from the other Beatles songs, especially because that was such an inspired choice. And I was wondering about your process for that. How do you choose what to incorporate, when to incorporate, and how to use them, especially in a new project like Now and Then? It was walking a tightrope of taste, really. I said to Paul, you know, you kind of, the Beatles would kind of put backing vocals on us, but obviously they're not around. So maybe we could take some ooze and ahs from Beatles records. But anyway, we'll try it. <laughs> try it and then see what happens. And, um, you know, I'd done this sort of thing with Love, the Love album before and the Love show. And I just took them from, I think, Here, There, and Everywhere, because, and a bit of Ella Rigby, because there's oohs and ahs on those, and they're long and they're clean, so they're not, they, they, don't, they don't have other instruments on them. And it was just probably a question of just seeing whether it worked, and it kind of made it sound more Beatlesy in a way, because you suddenly have the, mm-hmm. the, the other voices there. Um, and that was the thought process. It's more of a question of just you know, taste. It's sort of, you know, you're trying to, trying to paint a picture in some ways and, and hopefully doing a good job. Oh, yeah, we think so. I mean, that was one of those moments, like the yeah. drums came in, it's like, oh, that's a Beatles song. And then the, the Oz came in, you're like, oh, my God, yeah, this is absolutely a Beatles song. Well, that's the yeah. key, because it is a Beatles song. That's why we did, Ringo played drums. Ringo just played drums live, played with the song. That's what he does, you know. There's no trickery going on. I mean, okay, I'm, I'm taking, but the Beatles do that themselves. They take a tape and they splice it with another tape. But, you know, things aren't put in time or in tune. It's when they'll talk about technology. There's most other songs in the charts have way more technology applied to them, apart from cleaning up John's voice than and Now and Then does. It's fairly standard as a song. Now, just related to that, did the amount of music that you have, especially with George's contribution, was that a challenge? Was there enough, did you feel, to make George feel like a full contributor? Well, George is playing electric guitar and acoustic guitar on the track, and he he's playing rhythm guitar. He's the, he's he's a guitarist. I mean, the sad thing is he didn't play the solo, but 
that Paul sort of wrote that section as a tribute to George. The funny about the Beatles, people, you know, you could argue this, but you could say, you know, Ella Ruby is a very much a Beatles song, but it has only Paul on it, and he's not even playing an instrument. Or there are there are songs by the Beatles, which George is playing just rhythm guitar on. Paul was absolutely sure that when we did the track, when we did the strings, he really made us focus on George's rhythm guitar part and saying that this is what he's trying to do. We have to make sure that we sync a bass with his rhythm and listen to solo's guitar and it was like, you know, George had done the part and left and had to go and do something else. And and Paul's there saying, listen to what he's trying to do here. So, yeah, they, they were all part of it. And it's so evident in the audio. On that same note, Giles, I have kind of a question for you that has been a rumor around the interwebs lately. But can you confirm or deny that the original cassette tape had for Paul written on it? I don't know. I never saw it. Did it go straight to Wingnut? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Because Paul started working on this. He went, he went to Wingnut. Paul started working on this without without me knowing of his, his, his existence. And when he was doing some stuff, he came to see me and said, what do you think of this? So I couldn't either confirm or deny that. The mystery stays a mystery. <laughs> yes. It stays a mystery, as it yes. should. Yeah. <laughs> Speculation is right. <laughs> I know. I just had to ask. I had to ask. So obviously, you know, now and then it's huge, but another massive component of these releases are the Red and Blue albums. Um, and those mixes are phenomenal. I started listening yesterday and please, please me, totally blew my mind. The early stuff is really interesting. I think the early stuff is really exciting, actually. What we managed to get from the Red album, actually out of everything, including now and then, maybe thought, you know, this is really fun. You know, they suddenly sound punchy and like, like a, as, as Ringo says, a bunch of punks in the room. You know, that's what they sound like. <laughs> Once you had the technology to demix the earlier songs, did your approach have to change at all? I mean, when you think about songs that would work in Atmos, Love Me Do may not be the first thing you think of, but even though the original tracks are so much simpler, the effect was astounding. Like, I had to step away from them a few times when I first heard them. They felt so powerful. Yeah, same. What's fun about the Beatles and what we get to do is we get to push technology all the time. I, I I suppose I'm can, can be responsible for it. Like a lot of this demix stuff came from my demands that I put on Wingnut post get back for things like Revolver. I was like, let's see if we can apply it to music. You know, so we're doing it for dialogue for get back, and then we're doing things like you know, if we can isolate Ringo's drums from a single track, which has guitar and bass on it, then we'll put him back into studio too, where he first recorded. And so it's eerie. You can walk to studio to Abbey Road and Ringo's playing drums. You know. And it's him playing, you know, whatever it please believes me or love me do. And that would have never been heard in that room like that. And that then Atmos Wives gives us the right space to put the things in which gives you clarity and so on and so forth. So I think that doing an Atmos mix of love me do is tough. And, you know, it's not fully immersive. I mean, I, I don't, my approach to Atmos is not to, you know, it's not to make it gimmicky, basically. That's, that's why I try and train people to do as well. You should never listen to a mix. You should listen to a song. Do you know what I mean? You shouldn't listen mm-hmm. to the mix of Love Me Do. You should go, I like yeah. it. I'm going to put it on. And please, you enjoyed it. That's all I can say. And, and all I try and do, and we try and do, is do the best job we can of it. For Next Gen fans born after the Beatles broke up, Red and Blue is a seminal album. Well, yeah, it is. And for me, actually, funny, because I'm one of those generations. I mean, I this may sort of surprise people. I probably know the, the running order of Red and Blue Bed by do a lot of the albums because that's what I grew up with. And it's one of those albums where it's not really a greatest hits album per se. It is a sort of bona fide album in the same way yeah. that Queen's greatest hits or the Eagles greatest hits or Legend by Bob Marley is. It's one of those greatest hits albums that goes beyond that. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I think. Yeah. And speaking of the track listing, Giles, obviously there's more George incorporated. So how did you decide which George tracks to incorporate? Because, you know, obviously on the red, we have now like Roll Over Beethoven. And how do you choose that versus, say, a George original, like Don't Bother Me? A lot of it was based on popularity, funny enough, of tracks. The initial thought behind you know, Now and Then and What the Hell Do We Do With It was going to be based on what people were listening to. You know, In My Life is very popular. Blackbird is very popular. Here Comes the Sun, which isn't on any compilation album, is the most streamed Beatles track. And that's how it started. And then it sort of blossomed from there into, wait a second, am I just mixing a playlist here? That doesn't make any sense. That's not necessarily Beatles. Like, if that's going to change as soon as a film comes out or a TikTok thing comes out with a Beatles song on it. 
So that's so that's kind of answered that question. Is the reason why that is is because of it's a track that's listened to a lot. As you said, you know, you were of the generation where you grew up with red and blue. So we have to ask you: Are you more red? Are you blue? Are you purple? It's a good question, actually. I would have said that without question, I was more blue. But I think I'm probably going more red nowadays just because of what has happened to the tracks. The most exciting revelation for me, and a revelation in what I've been doing with the Beatles for a long time, is where we got to with those early tracks and thinking, these sound like a bunch of punks, you know, as Ringo would say. This what is, this was, this sounds different, but in a really good way. I remember. I kind of realized that I was onto a good thing where I played someone who's a big fan of the Beatles, a friend of mine. And I have a button in my control room, which basically switches from the new mix to the old mix. And I go to press the button and he was, you know, he was listening to Hard Day's Night or something like that. And uh, he goes, what, what have you done to it? I said, well, what do you mean what have I done to it? He goes, well, where's it, where's it gone? I mean, what have, you, what have you done to it? I went, I've switched to the, switched to the old mix. And he goes, this sounds like, a, sounds like an MP3. You know, where where where, where the drums go? Wow. And it's funny, if you do that, you suddenly realize there's, there's, you're losing dynamics and all that sort of stuff. I was thinking, well, this is great because it's not for me or for, it's like for my kids who, you know, will put on Carly Simon followed by Fleetwood Mac followed by the Arctic Monkeys thinking they're all the same era, you know. Totally. And then they'll put on the Beatles, they'll only listen really to later Beatles songs or quieter Beatles songs because there's not enough punch to them. The, the records sound old. It's like you try and get a teenager to watch a movie that, it's in the 80s, and they go, this looks old. Nothing old about them anymore. No. My theory is that, you know, recordings don't get old. Recordings, by their nature, are time capsules. You know, George will be 20 on those records for the rest of his life. We just get old around them. You know, that's what happens. And it's it's whether we can, people, you can travel that time capsule, which I think we're getting better at. And you can go, oh my God, this is what they were like in a room. They were a good band. This whole time capsule feel different eras interacting with one another. So surreal. Yeah. And the theme of the project is so poignant. And I would imagine it's especially poignant for you as you're carrying on your dad's legacy and producing the last Beatles song and bringing these first songs into the modern sound. What do you think your dad would have thought about the Now and Then project? I think he loved it. I mean, he obviously experienced Free as a Bird, which he, did, which he didn't do. But we did a song, a track called Grow Old With Me, which was on the Lennon we did that together, even up until his death. My dad wasn't a sort of fuddy-duddy old guy. He loved innovation. He absolutely adored progressiveness in all forms. And I think that's why he was so great for the Beatles. You know, He was this sort of looked like this sort of old schoolmaster, but really was really quite perverse at times in his ideas. You know, So I think, he, you know, he said to me back in the days of doing the love show, when I started working on it and I'd play him what I was doing, he just said, you know, it's like audio is putty in your hands. I wish I had this when I was working. At the same time, I'm kind of happy I didn't. I hope he liked the string arrangement of Now and Then. And did you write that with Paul and, and with another collaborator? Or is that your composition? It was a collaboration. I mean, I, I worked with a guy called Ben Foster, who's a, straight, who's a regular ranger. I've worked with all, all my stuff. Uh, we did some films together, and Paul, but I suppose I'd probably say I was the driving force behind what was going on. I said, it's funny, I saw I saw Ben last night. We did it, we just done the Disney project together. <laughs> Hundred years of Disney we've just done. And he was he was talking about it. And and it was kind of a tribute to my dad, the arrangement. You know, that's what that's what it was. At the same time, Paul was wanted to make damn sure it, that we didn't make it a tribute record, you know, that mm -hmm. The Beatles don't really look back. It's only other people that look back on the Beatles, if that makes sense. And there's this bittersweet element to the song, which John's so good at. And I think that's what touches people. Because I think the song has really touched people much more than they, I think they imagined, actually. Oh, yeah, for sure. It's yeah. an emotional experience. Yeah, I, mm -hmm. which, which is kind of, you know, not that you want people to be sad, but it's good that it is. You know, it's good that mm. these things make people sit up and think, do you know what I mean? And I think that video is, I think the video is really beautiful. We only, when we're older, can say to people, you know, when you're 25, you're going to be the same age as that for the rest of your life. You know, we just get old around ourselves, do you know what I mean? Absolutely. And that's what that video says to me. It's like, oh my God, you know, 
this is a young Paul with an old Paul or a young, and it's that weird thing you go, it must be weird. If only we could go and meet ourselves and tell ourselves what we thought. Did Paul and Ringo have an especially emotional experience creating now and then? I shouldn't really speak on behalf of them, but I think we all did. Just having been in a situation where they're suddenly back in the room, you know, being Beatles again. And the Beatles are, are such a weird thing. The trauma, which I think it probably was, they went through. Only they know. Only they know what it's like to be a Beatle. No one else. And no one on the planet will ever experience anything like what they went through. So true. Well, Giles, we don't want to keep you any longer than we have to. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the pod. Um, one more just quick question. I saw on Twitter that you now have an action figure. Oh, yeah. Um, and your dad. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and your dad. This, yeah, <laughs> this came from, this guy sent me, for some reason, someone showed me a link of my dad, um, had done an action figure of my dad. And I contacted him saying, just, I just think this is the funniest thing. And he goes, you're not upset. I was like, no, I think it's great. And then I said, but you know, I'd love to, I'd, I'd love to buy one off you. I'll give it to my mum." And then he made one, he sent me two of my dad and one of me. Amazing. So I might have an action figure of myself. And then I just said, listen, do you want to sell them in the Abbey Road shop? And he went, really? I was like, yeah, come on, it'd be a laugh. And so you, you can now buy a George Martin, but you can't buy a Giles Martin action figure. There's, there's only one of those because uh, <laughs> I was about them going on sale immediately. It'd be like, you know, $3.99 for a Giles Martin action figure. But you can buy it, you can actually buy it in the average <laughs> oh, yes. shop. George Martin action, action figure. I'm so excited. I'm going to be there over Christmas time. So I will absolutely freaking lutely be buying some George Martin action figures. <laughs> That's super cool, actually. <laughs> I was so excited now. I know what everyone's getting for Christmas next year. Yeah. Yeah. Shh, Erica, <laughs> you're not supposed to know that. Uh, all right. Well, thank you again, thank you Giles, so, much. so, so much. Okay, this has been so much fun. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks again to Giles for joining us today. And thanks to you for listening to BC The Beatles. Next time, we'll be going track by track on the new Red Album. As always, subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you're listening right now, and give us a rating and review so other Beatle maniacs can find us. And as always, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, slash X, and TikTok. Thanks, Ooh. Erica, for starting up some TikToks. We'll be posting photos and more from this episode and beyond. Remember, you can always email us at bcthebeatles.com too, and we will see you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.